Hello everyone, thank you for coming. My name is Vittorio Romeo, and I currently work at Bloomberg as a software engineer. Today I'm going to talk to you about multi-threaded compile time entity component systems in C++14. And you can find everything about this talk on this repository on GitHub, which should be public right now. So this is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to take a look at the entity component system pattern in general. Then we're going to take a look at the library that I built, which is called ECST. And we're going to take a look at what its design is, its features, limitations, and hopefully it'll inspire you to try new techniques in your code. Then we're going to have a look at a new usage example of the library. And then we're going to take a look at the architecture and implementation and some future ideas and considerations. So how many are familiar with this pattern, the entity component system? All right. So it's a pretty famous uh, patterning and game development. And the idea is that we have this concept of an entity, which is something that's usually related to a real world object or a game object. It has some related data and or logic. We deal with many entities, but we might want to track specific entity instances. Entities can be created and destroyed. And some examples of entities are, in the case of a game, maybe the player, a bullet, or a car. In the example of a GUI library, it could be a widget, with the window, the text box, or a button, or something like that. So entity systems uh, and the entity component system pattern allow us to manage entities in an efficient and convenient way. There are many ways we can encode entities in our projects. Probably the most, like the basic one, the simplest one, is using OP inheritance. In this case, the entity type is a polymorphic class. We store the data inside the class itself, and we handle the logic using virtual function, using runtime polymorphism. So if we have a base entity, we can derive from it with a widget, and then we can derive our real widgets from the widget base class. And this is very easy to implement, but unfortunately, it is occasion-friendly because we cannot leverage the fact that uh, the memory is not stored in a contiguous array. It has runtime overhead due to virtual functions, and it's not very flexible. And this is an example of where this approach fails in terms of flexibility. Let's say we're making a game and we have a skeleton, and we want a skeleton with a sword that derives from our base skeleton, one with a shield. Now, let's say we want one that has both the sword and the shield. What are we going to do here? This is the classical diamond inheritance problem, and this shows the lack of flexibility of encoding entities this way. So you, what you could do, you could restructure your tree, but the problem is that you have exponential uh, explosion of classes and direct classes, so it's pretty bad. This is what it looks like in code. We have a base entity, which has some virtual, a virtual interface, and the concrete entity derives from it and implements the logic and some data related to the game, the game entity in this case. And as you can see, we're using virtual and overhide. So this is using runtime polymorphism, which incurs a runtime cost. A better solution is using OOP composition. In this case, an entity is just an aggregate of components, and the components store the data and the logic, and the logic is still handled using runtime polymorphism, so using virtual functions. So let's say we have a text box. We try to find what matters for the text box. So we might have a position component, a style component, a focus component and an align component. And basically the entity, which is a text box, is just a composition of those small pieces. This is still easy to implement. It's more flexible. We don't have the diamond inheritance problem. But it's still cache and friendly because we cannot use contiguous storage and everything is allocated on the free store. So there is considerable runtime overhead. This, however, solves the diamond problem. Like we can create our skeletons by composing something like the AI component, the sort component, and the ammo component for one of them. And in the other one, we can reuse some of those components and mix and match the pieces. So we have a more flexible system, but it's still not good enough. So this is what it would look like in code. Instead of having a base entity class, we have a base component class, which uses virtual in order to define its logic. And then the entity is just a dumb container of components. And we have a non-virtual update and non-virtual draw, which will iterate over the components and call the logic that's specific to that piece, basically. As you can see, there is uh, indirection in the form of unique pointer and virtual function, so it's not really efficient. We can do better. Another thing to consider is how we could do component communication. We could use like an event bus and generate events that will be read from other components, or just use references and be careful with them. So, this is the, uh, an example of a concrete component. We just derived from the component base class. And our concrete entities are not classes anymore. They become functions that build the entity by 
appending component. So in this case, we don't have a skeleton class, but we have a make skeleton function that will return an entity which is filled with the components we need. The approach that I'm going to use in this library, and that's probably the best one for the entity component system implementation is a data-oriented approach. And data-oriented has multiple meanings, but what I mean by data-oriented is trying to leverage the cache as much as possible and design our code around the data and not vice versa. In this case, an entity is just a numerical ID. Components only store data, so they are logicless. And logic is handled using a new piece of the equation, which is a system. This is potentially cache-friendly because we can store all components of the same type in a single array. It has minimal runtime overhead because we don't need virtual dispatch or runtime uh, in, in directions such as unique pointer. And it's very flexible because, as you can see, you can think about it in terms of a relational database where you just stick the components that every entity has. So you can build your entities by, you know, putting every single piece that you require in order to get the logic and the data that you need for the concrete widget or game object. The problem is that it's considerably harder to implement and you need a good layer of abstraction around it in order to make it convenient to use. So this is the skeleton example from before. In this case, we have three instances of the skeleton entity and we'll build them by adding components to them and the systems will basically look for all entities that match a specific component signature. In this case, the entity has to, be, has to have both AI and sword for the first system, and the entity has to be both AI and shield for the second system. And as soon as entities are created, they are automatically bound to the systems, and the system will perform logic on those entities. So as you can see, there is a very, uh, 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 like the logic and the data is split between the components and the systems. The components do not do any kind of logic. This is a nice separation of concerns between the components and the system. And you can think about matching entities to system as a lock and a key. And basically the entity instance is this kind of socket. And if the system matches the bit of this entity by doing a by bit ways and then we say that the entity is subscribed to the system and the system can perform logic because it has all the required components that are needed by the system to change the state of the entity. So we do this byte ways and, and we get basically, we, we see if it matches the original entity. And if it does, we can subscribe the entity to the system and access the component that we require. This is how it looks like in code. This is a very naive implementation. So as you can see, the entity is a simple number. Components are plain old data structures, so they have no virtual, no, no, no methods at all, they're just data. And then we have some kind of manager class that wraps everything together. We store our components contiguously in arrays. Maybe in this case, we just have fixed arrays. It could be dynamic, or you could use other storage strategies which are more clever. And when we want to perform logic on the entities, we have an extra piece of the equation, which is the system that is aware of the manager. And when you call process, which will execute the logic on every entity that matches the specific system, it will ask the manager to give uh, the system all the entities that have those specific components. And then the data of the components can be retrieved via this kind of, a kind of indirection that hides the idea of having a single array. So basically the, manager, the system is asking the manager, please give me all the entities that have both AI and Bones component and perform that lambda on every entity that matches. We don't care about, uh, uh, about uh, where the component is stored. We don't care how the entity is represented. We're just separating the concerns very cleanly. And this allows us to have uh, cache friendliness because we can store components in a single array and various other benefits such as easy realization or networking. Systems can also have data, state, and produce outputs. So you can already start thinking about concatenating system in a chain of operations where a system produces the output and the other system reads from the previous one. And basically you go and create your game logic or application logic by combining systems together. One issue with this design is deciding how to store components. If we use an array like in the code example, it's quite simple to and suitable for most projects. And it is very easy to add and remove components at runtime because 
the index of the array corresponds to the identifier of the entity. And when we want to bind a component to an entity, we just construct it at a specific index and maybe use something like a bit set to signal the entity that now it has the specific component. The problem is that this is not as sketch friendly as it can get and is wasteful of memory because if you're constantly adding and removing entities, you will have holes in the arrays and you need to either uh, find a way to defragment de de the arrays or be clever how now you re reuse those holes in the arrays. Another idea is to have a mega array, which is a single buffer where we store components contiguously and the idea is that a single entity will be constructed in place with all its components in this array. So when you iterate over the entities, you will get all the data of the components in the cache immediately. But the problem is that while this is potentially cache friendly and has no memory waste, it's very hard to implement because you, you need a way of bookkeeping all the entity instances with their components. So it's very hard to keep track of what are the three slots and how to allocate uh, components and entities in a very efficient way so you can use the cache properly. So, are the notions of entity components and systems clear to everyone? Okay, good. So let's talk about ECST, which is the library I developed that allows you to create your own entity component system implementation and develop an application on top of it. Basically, this is what it does. You give it some component and system types and given those types, the library allows you to define declaratively at compile time how you want to store those components. Maybe you want to use a structure of array layout or an array of structure layouts, or maybe use an hash map. It doesn't matter. Uh, it allows you to define declaratively relationships and dependencies between system. So if you have two separate branches then then fork and then join, they will be automatically parallelized by the library. So you can, can create this kind of um, graphs of system interactions which will communicate with each other and be parallelized automatically. It will also allow you to parallelize a single system in multiple subtasks. So if you have like a system that's doing physics calculations which are not related in terms of order, you can split that system in multiple threads and that will be done automatically by the library. And also it will allow you to set some application-wide settings such as uh, choosing the difference between a fixed entity limit and a dynamic entity limit in order to get a little bit more performance if you're aware in advance of how many entities you're going to have. And the important thing about all of this is that the application logic is completely independent from the choices above. So you can mix and match those choices, you can change them, and you don't have to touch your game logic or application logic. It's all abstracted away. So let's take a look at an example of declarative settings. So I'm using this kind of fluent interface where you have a context auto variable in this case, I'm making the application settings. And by chaining metal calls together, I'm basically building a type at compile time that stores the information about those settings. So in the upper right corner, you can see the application settings where I'm just saying that we want to allow inner parallelism. So we want to, the, the library to split system automatically in multiple threads. We have a fixed entity limit. We have a set of components, a set of systems that we define in advance and a specific scheduler to access the threads. And the other example is the signature of a system, which is basically the settings, the options that you are giving to a specific system. And we're saying that we want to create this signature, which will be stateless, so it will be a system with data. And the system will be split evenly by the number of cores that are available. It will read the acceleration component and it will write the velocity component. So if you think about the implementation of the system, it will just get a const auto ref to the acceleration component and increment the velocity by the acceleration. And this can be automatically parallelized. The way I, did, I implemented this is by using boost HANA and I implemented a compile time data structure which is called option map on top of it. And we'll look at the implementation later. And I think that the user syntax is pretty nice because you can just specify what you want and it's gonna be stored inside a type. And it's also checking a compile time that you don't accidentally change the same setting twice. So how would you use ECST if you wanted to make your own game or application? First, you define component types and system types. And these are simple C++ classes. You don't have to satisfy any concept and you don't have any uh, library specific class to derive from. Afterwards, you have to define some tags. If you're familiar with Boost HANA, you know that 
types can be wrapped into values and vice versa, and this is basically it. It's a, it's a value that represents the type of the component of the system, and this is passed around to the library in order to execute the logic. Then you define component signatures. This is an example of a signature that says, take the acceleration component, the velocity component, and put them together in a contiguous buffer. So what this is doing is telling at the system at compile time that the data for acceleration and velocity will be stored interleaved in a single buffer. So you can just create your own storage strategies depending on how you're going to use the cache. Then you can define system signatures, which is similar to what we've seen before. In this example, we have the render system, which cannot be parallelized because probably there are some dependencies with the rendering system. It depends on a previous system, the velocity system. So, it, so this will not be executed until the velocity system has, is done. It will read both the position and sprite components, and it will output a vector of vertices. So at the end, you have all these vertices, and you can send them to the rendering system. Then you can define the context settings, which is what we've seen before, just application-wide settings such as entity limit or what, how we want to handle parallelism. Then we instantiate this EST, ACST main context class, and then we can access system interfaces and component data through proxy objects. So this is an example. We have the instantiated context, and we want to execute some systems. We call step with a lambda, which will be automatically called with this magical proxy object, which gives us the opportunity of calling some special methods such as execute systems and restricts the scope in which we can execute some operations. So the point of this pattern is to prevent mistakes for the user and to have a very limited scope where we can access the system logic so that it cannot be called anywhere in the, prog in the program. It has to be called inside of a step of the context. So this piece of code basically just gets all the systems that match the acceleration and velocity tags, and for every subtask, and you can think of a subtask as a thread that's inside the system, like a, a split of the system. It will execute the process function on the system with the data that's given by the library. And the data is another proxy that allows you to get component data and system outputs. So, let's start looking at the core values and concepts of this library. So as we've talked, as I said before, it's a compile time library. Then it has a policy-based design and customizable settings for the user. The syntax has to be independent from the settings. It has to be multi-threaded, trying to avoid explicit locking as much as possible, and using the data flow, data flow programming paradigm, which basically means that we define a chain of operation in advance and then fire it over the a thread pool or whatever. And it's going to use Boost HANA as a modern metaprogramming way of dealing with compile time computations. And I'm trying to be as clean, as modern, and as safe as possible with C++ 14 features. Compile time ECS means that we know the component system types at compile time, but we can create component instances and entity instances at runtime. And we can also track the entities. If you need some sort of type erasure over the component systems, sorry, of the component types or the system types, you can always bridge it with an existing runtime entity component system framework and basically create a component that links them together. The point of having these restrictions is that we can generate very efficient code, so we have minimal runtime overhead, and we give the compiler better optimization opportunities. The drawbacks are that compilation times will be longer and that error messages are not very pretty. So this is an example of defining some components, position, velocity, and acceleration. Then we define a system and the system implementation. So in this case, as you can see, the acceleration system will read the acceleration uh, component and will write to the velocity component. In the acceleration implementation, we get this data proxy, which is the one that you've seen before in the context step, and we can ask this proxy to give us the velocity component and the acceleration component for a specific entity ID, and then do an operation on that. If you start getting the idea, you can see that we have no explicit way of getting the components from a storage type. We have no explicit parallelism here. So this function, this action, can be 
automatically parallelized by the library, and it is independent of where the component data is stored. Now I want to cover the error problem. So <laughs> this is uh, a misspelled field in a component, and we was compiled with GCC 5.3, and this is just like 5% of the error. It filled my whole terminal buffer, and it was horrible. Thankfully, Clang is a little nicer because it immediately pinpoints where the error is, but then it still fills the whole buffer. So this was bothering me too much, so I had to make a script that basically collapses the template instantiation, and it's a Python free script, and as you can see, this is the unprocessed error on the top left, and that's the processed error, and the question mark is just collapsing the template instantiations, and you can define uh, the depth in which you want to analyze the template instantiation in order to debug the error, basically. So if you're interested, you can find the script here. It's not very pretty, but it works. So now let's go on to the customizable settings and policy-based design. In this case, I chose that behavior and storage layouts can be chosen at compile time by the user, and the users are also allowed to create their own settings quite easily. So they can create their own scheduling algorithms, parallelization strategies, and data structure from the entity component data, and all they have to do is basically just satisfy a simple concept. There is no inheritance required or anything like that. And the focus is on composability, because you can have parallelization strategies that are just adapters or their own strategies, or maybe compose them. If you've seen Andrea Alexandrescu's allocator talk, it's something like that. You can just compose them together. So the syntax is independent from the settings, as I said before, and this is done through higher order functions and lambdas, because this way we can abstract where the data is coming from and just give an interface to the user that doesn't know the real implementation of the component storage layout or the parallelism. It's all independent. On the right, you can see uh, the execution step where we use this kind of overloading. We pass some lambdas and the library will automatically match the instance of the acceleration system, velocity system, and rendering system to the lambda that can be called with it. So there is no hard coding. The process method is not something that's special. You can have any kind of method in this system. The only way you can access those is by going through this step that abstracts away the idea of storing the system somewhere. multi supports is quite simple. Basically, we have a directory, a cyclic graph that gets implicitly generates a compile time by the, system, by the library. And we start executing the root of the graph. As soon as it's done, we can parallelize the children and every node itself can be parallelized in multiple subtasks if the user allows it to. And as soon as the subtask is done, then the node will be marked as done, and we can continue execution. So you don't have to create any threads, spawn any async computation. This will be done by the library for you, depending on the dependencies that you defined declaratively at compile time. The idea of meta modern metaprogramming and the core principle of Boost HANA is type value encoding. This means that types can be wrapped into values and vice versa, and this allows us to write very concise interfaces that can evaluate uh, stuff at compile time in a very, very nice syntax. And as an example, this is a parallelism policy that can be used uh, on a specific system, and it says that if we are below 10,000 entities, then don't parallelize, otherwise split time only by the number of cores. This is basically it. You could compose this in other ways. Maybe you could have a strategy for another range of entities. So it's, it's pretty nice and it's done at compile time. This is an example of type value encoding because we're wrapping the number into angle brackets to make it a compile time aware number so we can retrieve that value at compile time and use it for computations. And the whole thing, as you can see, is constexture. So it's basically building up a type which contains that information. And you can pass around the priorities policy value at compile time, and it will not lose information about uh, the settings that you've chosen. <laughs> this is another example. In this case, uh, this is like from the implementation of the library. And I have a list of system signatures, which are basically the settings, and a list of system tags and I want to transform the tags to the IDs. So what do I do? I can use boost HANA transform in a constructor function by using a lambda. 
So what I'm doing is I'm passing these compile time values by value as if they were runtime uh, instances, and I'm using a lambda in a compile time computation. So this is very natural syntax. It looks like just a runtime com uh, computation, but it's all done at compile time. So this is a very, very natural and intuitive way of dealing with things that would have required 40 angle brackets before. So before we move on, I want to show you a full code example of something that has been implemented using the library. So you get an idea of what, how it actually looks. So. So this is the demo, which is a very, very simple particle simulations. You're looking at 50,000 particles that collide with each other and are constantly added and removed, and it runs at about 50 FPS on this machine, which is quite old. But if you disable parallelism, if you disable the optimization that the library does for you, it runs very slowly. So there is a very, very big benefit from automatically parallelizing the, the computations. And I'll show you the code and we'll walk through it so you can understand how simple and intuitive it is to use. So I hope that's readable. Is that okay? Okay. So the example consists of a simple particle simulation, as you've seen, and the particles are massless and collide with each other in a perfectly inelastic way. They also collide with the boundaries of the window and are continuously destroyed and replaced by new particles. Every particle has the following components position, velocity, acceleration, color, circle, and life. And you can see on the right what they contain. And the systems that will execute the simulation are as follows. We will have the acceleration system that has no dependencies, so it can be the root of the chain computations. And it can be parallelized. We have a velocity system that will move the particles, and it depends on the acceleration system because the velocity component will be modified. The keeping bound systems will prevent the particles from leaving the simulations when there is. Then we have some spatial partitioning system that has some state. And this is an example of how a system can be stateful and useful to have extra data that's related to the simulation. And in this case, the spatial partitioning system will have a 2D grid that will speed up the both phase collision detection. And it will produce as an output a list of entity ID and grid index in order to bind a specific entity to a cell. Then we have the collision system that will read what has been produced by this partial partitioning system and check for collisions in entities inside the same cell. Solve contacts will just depend on collision and resolve the velocity of the particles. And then we have a rendering system that just uses the SFML library to render the circles on the screen and a life system that will decrement the lifetime of the particles continuously and replace the dead one with new ones in order to show how you can create new entities. So we begin by defining the boundaries of the simulation and some helper structs. This is for a contact, and basically we will tell you that entity E0, anyone collided with a specific distance between them. Then we have this data here that's used for the spatial partitioning system, and it says that the entity E belongs to the cell at coordinates X and Y. And then we can start defining the components. It's a little too, okay. So as you can see, this is just the component definitions. They are plain old data structures. There is nothing special here. Position as just a vector of two floats. Velocity and acceleration as well. The color is just an SFML color, which is a bunch of uh, byte values. And the circle and light components just are floats. So it's nothing special. What we need to do next is define some tags that we can, we can pass around as values so that we can execute compile time computations. And the tags simply wrap the type of the components and the systems in a value that can be passed around. And one benefit for the syntax is that if we want to use the type to call a method on the data proxy, for example, we would have to disambiguate with the template keyword because in a template context, the compiler has trouble understanding whether or not you're trying to call operator less than or actually specifying a type for a template. 
but with tags, there is no ambiguity, so we can just pass it as a, as a value, and it will be evaluated at compile time to get the type wrapped into the tag, and it will do the same thing, basically. And this is an example of what I call type value encoding. In this case, I use a macro to define the tags, but it simply expands to something like this. We define the tag with the same name as the component, and we wrap it inside this special tag component v concepts auto uh, template variable, and then we can use it as a value in our, in our computations. And we do the same for the systems. So after we define all tags, we will, the component tags will belong to the CT namespace, which stands for component tag, and the system tags to the ST namespace. Now we can define the logic of our systems. Systems, as I said, are simple classes as well, and they don't have anything special. So what you do is define your class here and provide any kind of state and methods that you want. If you want to access component data and other systems, you have to provide a method that will accept a, da a data proxy. Since the type of the data proxy depends on the settings that the user specified, this has to be a template parameter. So in this case, I decided to provide a process method that takes a delta time used for the computations and the data proxy that will allow me to get the data from the library. And I can query the data proxy for all entities that match the current system. And for all those entities, I can just retrieve the velocity component, the acceleration component, and increment the velocity by the acceleration multiplied by the delta time. Again, as you can see, there is no specific multi-threading instructions here, no way, I'm not specifying how I want to get that data. This is very generic and can be, can be parallelized by, this, by the library. By the way, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. This is the velocity system, which is which just basically the same thing as the acceleration one, but increments the position of the velocity, so it's, it acts on different values. The keep inbound systems will get a, we'll have a process function that gets the data proxy, but it's not frame time dependent, so we don't need the frame time. And this is an example of how you can augment the logic processing system with any argument you want, because it's not hard coded. And in this case, we just get the position, get the velocity, get the radius. We calculate the edge positions of the particle, and we invert the velocity and move the particle away from the boundary if necessary. So this is a simple AABB collision detection system that just keeps the particles inside the boundaries of the simulation. Then we have a special partition system. This is an interesting example of where we are storing state inside a system. So in this case, we have some constants used for partitioning the space. And then we have an array of cells, which is our grid. And we will use this to uh, speed up the both phase collision detection. So the system will be instantiated by the library only once, so it guarantees that you have a single instantiation of the grid variable. And after all, we can act on that grid by clearing it with a method. Then we can retrieve the, the cell uh, by a specific index. And we can in place basically the, the IDs of the particles in a specific cell. So this is just implementation details for the simulation. The point is that at the end, when we will have our process method, we can access the data, we can iterate over the cells, find which cells belong to various particles, put them inside the array, and afterwards, we are using this output variable here, which is a special variable that's given by the data proxy, to, um, to basically uh, allow other systems to read the data that we're producing. So other systems that are after us in the chain of computations will be able to get the data that we're producing and use it in their own computations. So if you think about a situation where you have a fork and the children systems need to read data from the parent one, you can use this output variable and it will uh, automatically guarantee at compile time that only the children's can read it. If you try to access it from another system, it will give you a compile time error. So the collision system is an example of a reader that's reading from the spatial partitioning to actually check if a collision is happening, happening between two particles. 
And in this case, the data proxy again allows us to get a reference to the spatial partitioning system. And this line that gives us the reference only compiles if we explicitly specify that special partition is a dependency of collision. Otherwise, the library has no guarantees that this is valid because it could be a race condition. So it has to be an explicit dependency. For every entity in the subtask, we can then access the component data, access the grid cell, and for the unique pairs of the particles, we can do the radius calculation and see if they're actually intersecting. If they are intersecting, we're going to emplace a contact in our output, and then we can use these contacts in order to resolve the collisions and produce the bouncing of the particles. And this is the other system that uses another method called for previous outputs, which is, again, provided by the data proxy, and is basically saying, for all the outputs that ST collision produced, execute this function. And this function simply gets the distance between the particles and resolves the penetration by moving them away by their minimum intersection vector and modify the velocity to make them bounce. So as you can see, it's very, it's very functional. You're just chaining together operations that depend on each other and all can be parallelized automatically. The rendering system is again very simple. It has its own output because it will produce a set of vertices and then those vertices will be sent to the rendering system. And in this case, it just accesses the particle data, creates some triangles with some simple mathematical operations, and then places the vertices back in the vector. Afterwards, we will use this output in order to render the particles. The life system is a little bit more interesting. It is frame time dependent, and for every entity that belongs to it, it is decrementing the life of the entity by a specific constant which depends on the time and if the life reaches zero we're gonna kill the entity and kill entity is a special method provided by the data proxy and we're gonna defer an operation that will create a new entity at the end of the context step so this is quite different from what we've seen before the problem is that if we want to create a new entity during the system execution we would have to use explicit locking to avoid race conditions and if you're constantly creating new entities and destroying new entities, you're going to have a lot of contention and uh, slowdowns. So what I decided to do is to allow users to defer an operation to a later step. So this is actually creating an STD function that will be stored somewhere and will be executed later when there is no risk of race condition. And the killing of an entity is not actually destroying the entity, it's just marking it as that. So it will be recycled at the end of the, the context step when there is no risk of race condition. Then I define some variables here for the entity limit and the particle count that I'm going to spawn. And after I define my uh, plane of data, component types, and my system types, I need to transform this kind of definition into something that the library can understand and use. So what I'm doing here is creating a function that will create a component signature list and return it. And a component signature list is just a set of options per component type. So here I'm basically saying that I want the library to take acceleration and put it in its own buffer, velocity, position, and life, and put them in their own buffers. But since I access color and circle for the rendering at the same time, it makes sense, sense for them to be closer in cache. So I'm saying, please take color, take circle, and put them interleaved in the same buffer so that can be in the cache at the same time. And you can implement your own custom storage layout. It doesn't have to be contiguous buffer. So maybe if you have a huge component that has a huge size, you might want to use a Nash map, for example. And this is the same idea, but for systems. I need to transform the systems and provide uh, compile time data to the library that will define the options of the systems. And to do that, I'm creating a system signature list and returning it as a context function. So it's all compile time values. And what I'm doing here, I'm defining the parallelism strategy that I want to use to parallelize my system. And in this case, I'm saying that if I have below 100 entities, then I don't want to parallelize. This is non below threshold. Otherwise, I'm going to parallelize with this specific strategy here that just looks at the number of available cores and splits the system execution over those cores. 
And now that I have this, I can define every single signature for my system. So the acceleration system will read from acceleration right to velocity. Velocity will read to ve from velocity and right to position, and it will depend on the acceleration system, and so on for all the other systems. The interesting thing is that, for example, maybe we can lower the... Okay, the interesting thing about the special partitioning system is that it produces an output, so we need to tell the library what's the type of the output. And we're doing this because if we split the system in multiple subtasks, so maybe we have the system running in four threads in parallel, we don't want to have a single output variable, otherwise we would have to use a lock to fill it. So every subtask has its own output, and then they get accumulated at the end. So you can access them as if it was a single output variable, but you don't have any slowdown caused by explicitly locking in order to fill the output variable. And then we continue with dependencies, dependencies, and what we are doing basically is just defining our graph. This list of system options will be taken by the library and will be implicitly used as a directed acyclic graph. After that, we have some methods to create particles and more implementation details. What I want to show you is the update context function that will be called each frame. And what it does is calls the step function on the context and this step function, <laughs> <laughs> this step function gives us another type of proxy which allows us to execute systems. And the good thing is that if we don't have this proxy, we will never be able to call execute systems. So we are restricting the scope of this important operation because it could, re could lead to race conditions. And we define a bunch of tags here. The FT tags is a list of tags that are frame time dependent and it contains acceleration, velocity, and life. And the non-FT tags are non-frame time dependent and that's the collision stuff basically. And we're saying please execute all systems that belong to the FT tags by calling process and passing the, date, uh, the delta time and the data proxy. Please execute all the systems that do not rely on frame time and just call process without passing any other argument. So this is a customization point where the, uh, the user of the library can decide how to call its system and what arguments to pass in order to do any kind of stuff that it wants to. It, there is nothing ever coded here. Another thing you can do is have a more fine-grained execution because as you can see here, we're just saying execute this function for every subtask, but we may want to execute a function before we fork and a function after we fork in order to maybe deal with outputs and aggregate data produced by the subtasks. So this detailed instance function gives us another proxy, which is called the executor proxy that we can query to access the subtasks. But before we do that, we can deal with the special positioning system and clear all the cells. And after we do that, we can get all the outputs, and for every output in the special partition system, we can add it to a specific vector that then will be read by another, by another system. So this is a way of injecting functionality before and after the fork with, uh, with the automatic parallelization for a system. So after the execution, we can query again the step proxy to get all the system outputs of the render color circle that were uh, basically a vector of vertices, if you remember. And then we can ask this render target that's provided by the SFML library to render those vertices as triangle by using some default render stuff. So if you look at the big picture, what we basically did is that we defined a chain of operations. We didn't define how we want them to be executed. We didn't define how we want the data to be actually stored. So it's very declarative, and this will be executed by the library in parallel while possible. The last thing that's missing is just setting the, the context stuff, creating a context and running the simulation. So it's pretty straightforward. Now if we go back to the slides.
So any questions so far? <laughs> Many questions? <laughs> sure. What about what, sorry? Uh, I'll, I'll get to that in a second in the slides. It's not very complicated. One question? <laughs> Six seconds. Uh, both GCC and Clang are very close. I think Clang is actually seven seconds. Uh, but I wasn't using Boostana before. I had my own metaprogramming library and it took like 20 seconds. So you, you use Boostana. <laughs> So I'm gonna skip this part because we're quite low on time. So this is just the way that classes are put together. It's just the architecture of the library. And I'm gonna get to the implementation details, which is probably more interesting. So I'm gonna cover the execution flow and critical operations, and I'll get to that in a second. The challenges that I face during implementation, how systems are processed, what proxies are, and some example from metaprogramming module. So this is the flow of the execution of a program that uses the library. We have a begin step where we can inject some user code and have some critical operations. Then we have system execution, which is a self-contained step where this chain of parallel operation is executed. And then we have a refresh step at the end, which will execute the operations that we enqueued during the system chain execution. It will reclaim the memory of all the dead entities and it will match the modified and new entities to the systems. So if, you, if we created a new entity during the system execution, it will actually only be created during the refresh step. And when it's created, it will, it will look for all the systems that can match it and subscribe it to the system so that it is executed, that this logic is executed on the next step. What are critical operations? So there are some operations that require to be executed sequentially in a final step. And I call them critical operations. Uh, the idea is that these kind of instructions require either synchronization or allocations, though, so we cannot really execute them during the parallel system chaining, otherwise we might need explicit locking. So we just defer this operation to a later step, and then we execute them all at once sequentially. Examples of critical operations are creating or destroying an entity, because we need to deal with memory, adding or removing a component from an entity because we might need to match the entity to a different system or unsubscribe it if it doesn't match a system that it was in before, or running the system scheduler. Non-critical operations are analyzing the output of a system data because this is checked at compile time. We know that it, since it was a, one of our dependencies, it, has, it is done now so we can access its output, so there's no need for synchronization. Or marking an entity as dead, that's just a marker, we're not dealing with memory, or accessing and mutating existing component data. And we can do that because we're specifying in the system signature what components we're going to read and what components we're going to write. So it's all known at compile time. An example is that getting the previous output is non-critical, getting the health of a particle is non-critical, killing it is not critical because we're not actually dealing with memory, we're just marking it for recycling at the end of the step. But if we want to create a new entity and we want to create components on it, we need to defer this to a later step because we might potentially allocate depending on the storage layout that the user chose. And we want to do operations on the component we created to initialize the data. So this has to be done in a separate step because it could lead to race conditions or would require synchronization. And as you can see, when we call defer, we get this nice proxy that allows to do has to do these critical operations. And the point is that if you don't have the proxy, you, you cannot call those, those functions. So it's very safe. We are restricting the scope in which we can call those critical operations by using this lambda plus proxy pattern. The user code look, looks like this. We call step and we get a proxy in our basically callback. And this proxy allows us to call critical operations and start system execution. Then inside the body of this step, we have some user code here that's basically preparing the render system and rendering the data as an example. And then we have the system execution step, which can only be called inside the step proxy. And we're basically overloading lambdas here, depending on the system type, and calling a function over the match system. We are not specifying the order in which the system will be executed. We are not specifying how they will be parallelized. We are just saying that 
for this particular system type, do this. For this other system type, do this. And then the library will deal with it. And that's a very important brace because that will trigger the refresh step. At the end of the, of the step, when we exit the scope, the library will actually automatically trigger the refresh and deal with the deferred operations and the recycling of the memory. So here are some challenges that I encountered. One is obviously efficiently management of uh, entity IDs because that's done pretty much everywhere in the library. Then exploiting uh, compact knowledge to increase the performance and safety and dealing with the dependencies between system and paral uh, automatically parallelize them when possible. Uh, processing subsets of entities of the same system in multiple threads, dealing with additional removal and all of this while providing a clean, relatively clean and safe interface to the user. So the data structure that I use for the entity IDs is called sparse integer set. And it's a very useful data structure when you have to deal with IDs because it allows you to test the existence of an ID, insert an ID or remove an ID in big O of one. And it allows big O of K iteration where K is the number of integers currently in the set. So you're not iterating over the IDs that are not part of the set. And this is what it looks like. It's basically composed of two arrays or vectors. We have a sparse array and a dense array. The dense array allows us to efficiently iterate because it has no notion of order of IDs, while the sparse array basically links the ID that you're looking for, for uh, to a specific location in the dense array. And if you access it by index, you can get uh, whether or not the present in the set in O of one. So it's a very nice data structure for what we're trying to do. There are probably alternatives. Uh, Matthew Bentley had a talk on a special colony data structure at CPPCon and, uh, this year, and I really want you to look at that because it's a very, very interesting talk. And maybe something like that could be applied in order to get better performance when iterating over entity IDs. You may be thinking, why not use a bit set, an STD bit set? The problem is that a CD bit set doesn't allow us to iterate quickly because we always have to check if the bit is set or not. We don't have a list of bits that are currently set. So data structure, static dispatching, this is, you've seen this, this is the user syntax where we can basically change options of file time. And it is implemented using this option maps concept that I implemented on top of Bustana map. And they basically map a compile time key to a compile time value and a compile time Boolean. And the Boolean is there to prevent the user from accidentally setting the same option twice. And how do you use them? First, you create a namespace of keys, which are just compile time values with unique types. In this case, I'm just using numbers that are incrementing numbers. So as you can see, every key has a unique type. And after that, you implement a class for the set of options that you want the user to be able to change. And the class will contain an option map and this special function here called change self that given a key and a new value will set the value inside the option map and return a new instance of itself with a new type that contains the mutated map. So if you have done functional programming, this is like a structure where mutation doesn't really exist and mutation is defined as creating a copy with a change value. And this is very useful because we can do this at compile time and get the options uh, for the library basically. So as you can see, we are just returning a copy, construct auto, and when we're changing an options, we're using decal type on the new option map in order to create a new type basically. And the interface function, as a, for example, uh, set threading, will take a value and call change self on the specific key. So this is how you define the fluent interface, which will allow users to chain the methods together. So the set method is very simple. Uh, in this case, BH is Busana. And the first thing I do is static assert that I didn't set the setting, the option before to avoid the user er erroneously calling the method twice and overriding a previous setting. And this is done by simply getting the, the Boolean value uh, of that specific key and checking if it's false. If that passes, 
Then I'm going to I'm going to create a new map where I will replace the pair that had the key value before with the new value and changing the false to true. So I'm signaling that basically uh, I set this value. Yes, question. So the question is, is there any reason why you're not statically asserting if the thing is already in the map and then add it if it's not in the map? Uh, the, everything is already in the map because you are forced to specify a default value. So when you're defining your interface, you will have to, you are forced to have a default value. So in order to override those defaults and preventing multiple accidental overrides, I'm using this idea of the flag. There's probably a cleaner solution, but this works. So to branch a compile time, I'm using this static if thingy that I will talk about in my second talk today. And what it's basically doing is getting a 10 branch and an else branch, and it's only instantiating the branch that matches the constant expression, which is the condition of the if. So as you can see, we have two different interfaces in the then and else branch. One is calling get fixed capacity, and one is called the get dynamic capacity. And even if the settings does, does not support uh, that specific method, it will still compile because only the branch that matches the condition is going to be instantiated. The, the second one only has to be parsable and doesn't have to be valid, only parsable. And this is available in C17 as if const expert, which is a very nice feature. And if const expert is basically this with none of the ugly syntax and boilerplate. This is another example. If we have inner parallelism allowed in the settings, then we execute in parallel, otherwise we execute in a single thread. It's very easy to read. The alternative would be having a template specialization for every setting, but I find this is more local and easier to reason about. <coughs> Here's an example of dependencies. As you can see, you just create a chain of dependencies and you have to specify what components you're reading and writing and what kind of parallelism you want for the system. And after you define this, what gets created is basically a directly a single graph where you are splitting every system in multiple subtasks, waiting for all the subtasks to complete, and then move on to the next system. Another thing that's important is that this is statically asserted if you are saying that you are only going to read from a component and you try to get a mutable reference to it, it will not compile. So you need to be careful about, uh, you need to specify like in a clear way what components you want to mutate and what components you want to read. So we're almost out of time. I'll try to be, to go to the important stuff. So I'm using a thread pool, very simple. It's just a bunch of tasks which are STD functions that get dispatched to some workers. And in the middle I have this very nice blocking concurrent queue by Cameron Des Rogers, and it's uh, under the simplified BSD license, and it's quite fast, very, and very easy to use. <coughs> For synchronization, I'm using a latch, and a latch is basically the union of a, a condition variable and a counter, and it's, it blocks until the counter reaches a specific value. And it's aggregating a mutex, which will, which will be used by the condition variable to wait until the counter reaches zero. As you can see from the, from the syntax on the right, we're saying that we are creating this latch with a counter of n, so let's assume n is five, then we're executing this, this function here and waiting until that five becomes zero. So we're expecting the run tasks to decrement the counters in a, an atomic way. This is going to be part of the standard uh, eventually, it's currently in the concurrent CTS, and it's called a CD experimental latch. So you can just think about it as a counter that blocks until the counter reaches zero. This is the interface. It just, it can be constructed with an initial counter value. It can execute a function and wait until it reaches zero. And you can decrement the counter and notify another thread or all threads on the condition variable in a very clean way. And basically this is implementation, you just 
lock on the mutex and call the function passing the condition variable on the counter. And once you have access to the CV counter, you can then assert the validity of the counter, decrement it, and notify other threads. So it's very simple. I'm going fast because we're almost out of time, sorry. Uh, that's pretty much it. For the system scheduling, I'm, I explored generating a when all then chain with futures. But the problem is that futures have a significant runtime overhead. So it's not as good as having the latch. Uh, well, using the latch is quite simple to implement at compile time in order to generate the chain of, of executions. Uh, I also need to be sure that uh, I count my dependencies as a system because I want to execute only if all my dependencies have been executed. So every system also has an atomic counter of the previous dependencies that get decremented when a dependency is done. And as soon as the dependency counter reaches zero, I can execute a specific system instance. This is what it looks like. I first compute the number of systems in the chain. Then I create a latch that will wait until all the systems are completed. And then I will start the execution. And this will block until all the systems are completed. After that, I have this run function on a task. And a task represents a system where I execute the system. I decrement the condition variable, uh, sorry, the, the counter that's waiting on the condition variable. And for every dependency of the system, I check whether or not it has been executed. And if all of them have been executed, then I can post my task in the thread pool. And the task that I'm posting is basically the overload over here. So I'm just saying, post this task in the thread pool, passing a specific system. It will go for the overload, find a specific type, and execute the process function that the user defined. Inner parallelism is even simple because you just need a latch and wait until the, all the inner subtasks are completed. And in order to make it possible, I have this idea of a parallel executor, which is a strategy on how you want to split the system in multiple subtasks. And you can compose it using compile time branching or other ideas. This is an example of an executor. There is a lot of boilerplate, but I hope you get the gist of it. So basically, we're getting uh, the split count, which is the number of subtasks we want to split a single system into. Then we're calculating how many entities we will process per split. Then we will prepare and wait on n subtasks. And what this does is just creates a latch with, uh, with the value n and executes the function that we're passing, which will execute every single subtask. And what happens is basically for every subtask, we have a thread in the thread pool. We run the subtask on a specific range of entities in the thread pool threads. And when the computation is done, the counter will be decremented and eventually we'll stop blocking on the latch and we can continue the system execution. In order to slice the systems, we need to get sub ranges of entities. And what I'm doing here is just returning a lambda that's binding the slice executor to a begin and end index so that I basically restrict the computation on a sub range of entities. And I'm, I'm doing this for every subtask that's generated by a system. Then after that, this is the function that will be called inside the parallel executor, which will give us a range of entities. And that's the data proxy. So the data proxy that you've seen in all the examples is just a range of entities that we can iterate upon using a nicer syntax. And after that, we, we're going to call execute subtask and decrement counter. We will call the function. And the function, again, is that overload on the system and the data and decrement the counter and notify all the, system, all the threads that are waiting on that condition variable. And after that, there's just proxies. And you've seen this before. It's basically a way of restricting computations and critical operation to a smaller scope. And now that we have all the pieces, we know how the step begins. We know the system execution is done. And we know how, and we, we're missing the refresh, basically. And if you read it sequentially, it's very simple. We're just executing the third operations, recycling the memory for the entities, and matching the new entities to the systems. So yeah, uh, let's, let's go to the refresh, which is the most interesting part. <laughs> 
So the refresh step is executed automatically when the context step ends. As you remember, when we exit the scope, and the first thing we do is execute all the deferred functions sequentially because we cannot do it in parallel as they require either allocation or synchronization. And in this case, we iterate over the system sequentially. We get all the states, which are basically the data that's bound to a specific subtask. And for every data of the subtask, we execute the deferred functions by passing the deferred proxy. And the deferred proxy gives us access to the data storage for the components and the entities. So we can actually allocate and create new and modify the memory. Then we have the second step, which is reclaiming the dead entities. In this case, we need to fill our state with all the dead entities IDs to avoid repetition. So this is like a set of dead entity IDs. And after we have the dead entities IDs, we can actually remove them from the system in parallel because we're just unsubscribing them from the systems. And since there is no risk condition here, we can do that in parallel. So in this case, we're just unsubscribing all the system from a specific entity and then reclaiming the memory at the end in a synchronous step that is not paralyzed. Then the last step is matching the entities to the systems. And this is done when we modify the set of components or when we kill entities, we need to upgrade the sub update the subscriptions of specific systems. So we run over them in parallel. And for this refresh state that we filled when adding or remove components, we check if the system now matches the bit set, which is the operation, the bit ways and that you've seen at the beginning of the talk. And if it does match, we subscribe the entity, otherwise we unsubscribe it. And this can be done in parallel because we have all the state of the modified entities in advance. This is some metaprogramming stuff where you can force constructs by using decal type and then immediately constructing an instance. But we're out of time. So as a conclusion, I have a lot of uh, links here. This was actually my uh, graduation thesis, so I have uh, even more detailed write-up in that paper. And then these are amazing links that I've used to do research and to experiment that have a lot of information on the ECS pattern and on game development uh, patterns that can use the cache in a very uh, friendly manner. Future ideas, maybe link subtasks together in order to avoid fork and join when we can actually parallelize based on subtasks, because at the moment there's gonna be a join between S0 and S1. And Try to avoid a CD function overhead by creating some sort of buffer where we can emplace functions like a queue and use some sort of V table to call the function sequentially. And maybe generalize the idea of options map and fluent settings to a library that can be used for, for to, from other people to create nice uh, fluent setting interface definitions. That's it. Thank you for attending.